Hi everyone. Today we are going to be doing a brief talk about Vladimir Lenin. Um, as you all learned about previously, Lenin winds up taking over the Russian Revolution in 1917 when he manages to successfully take over the Russian government during the October Revolution. Now, before we jump in on Lenin, uh, it's important to understand that Lenin was not always the leader of Russian socialist thought. Uh, Lenin was one of many different uh, political theorists um, coming out of the more Russian revolutionary school of socialism, and he wasn't even the most well-liked uh, up until 1917. So um, his brand of communism is sometimes thought of as a distinct brand, um, Leninist Marxist theory. So I don't want you thinking that Lenin is some kind of perfect embodiment of Marxism, um, because people at the time certainly didn't think that, although Lenin tried to claim as much. Now, Lenin himself is an interesting figure because when you look at what he does for Russia, um, some of it can definitely be regarded as positive. Uh, however, quite a bit of what Lenin does is very distinctly negative as well. And it's important to weigh those negatives against the positives that Lenin introduces when trying to figure out whether or not uh, Lenin's October Revolution was uh, worth it, so to speak. So, Lenin, um, as early as 1917, um, Leon Trotsky, who was the leader of the Red Guard, later on the Red Army, one of um, Lenin's uh, right-hand men, uh, was describing Lenin as Maximilian Robespierre. He made reference to the French revolutionary figure. Now, based on the way that Trotsky uh, behaved historically and how Trotsky uh, acted, this might not have been um, an insult. This might have actually been complimentary. In case, in case you needed a refresher um, over Maximilian Robespierre, he was the French revolutionary figure who, uh, using his power over the Committee for Public Safety around 1793-1794, was instrumental in bringing about what was known as the Reign of Terror. Uh, and during the Reign of Terror, Maximilien Robespierre created revolutionary tribunals uh, to find people who were uh, not possessing the correct revolutionary spirit uh, to put them on trial, which of course it was a, a fake show trial, and then ultimately to execute them for their lack of devotion to the revolution. Uh, this is actually a very, very apt uh, metaphor for the way Lenin behaves as well, because as we're going to see, um, Lenin really does fit the bill of a Maximilian Robespierre almost uh, to the point where history is repeating itself. So Lenin has control over Russia from 1917 until 1922. And in 1922, Lenin will have a stroke and will become uh, increasingly bedridden. Technically, Lenin is still in charge um, from 1922 until his death in 1924. However, there is gonna be a fracturing in those two year periods with his, uh, two of his closest confidants, uh, Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin, uh, rising to lead separate factions. Now, um, as soon as the Russian Civil War begins, 1917-1918 um, thereabouts, Lenin starts to bring about what's known as the Red Terror. Uh, the Red Terror is going to last um, for most of Lenin's time in power, and the Red Terror is... Um, almost uh, analogous to the reign of terror. What Lenin is doing is he creates a group known as the Sheka. And the Sheka was a secret police force. They were um, basically designed 
to find people who were acting against the revolution. And on the backdrop of the Russian Civil War, uh, those would be people who had sympathies towards the old czarist regime, people who had sympathies towards capitalism, um, people who had sympathies more to like their region. Uh, so for example, the Ukrainians were very closely tied to Ukraine and wanted um, uh, an autonomous and independent Ukraine. So these would all be people that the Sheikah would be looking at. And uh, effectively, the Sheikah would uh, get rid of these individuals. So during the Reign of Terror, we have uh, death tolls um, that are really, really hard to determine. Um, they go from tens of thousands to possibly upwards of 1.5 million. We're not exactly sure how many people were killed during the Red Terror. Um, and, and make no mistake, um, Lenin um, was the man behind this. Uh, Lenin very much so was a promoter of the Red Terror and Trotsky and Stalin were instrumental in carrying out um, this movement. Um, Stalin very enthusiastically, in fact. Um, this is one of my favorite um, propaganda posters that references the Red Terror. And of course, this is Leon Trotsky. And you can see that he is uh, naked, sitting on a throne of skulls with a bloody knife in one hand, a, a gun in the other, um, while in the background, Red Army soldiers are beating people to death uh, and a whole village is on fire. Uh, in Polish, up at the top, and this is, like I said, Polish propaganda, it says, uh, the wonders of Bolshevism. So very much a sarcastic type of message here. But this is very much what the Red Terror was all about. And if you're looking solely at the Red Terror, then it's pretty easy to say that Lenin was a horrible, despicable figure. And I don't know if I would necessarily contest that, but Lenin was also viewed by other people as very positive. So in this piece of propaganda, you can see what it says um, down below in Russian. Um, and what that translates to is, um, Comrade Lenin rids the world of filth. You can see that Lenin is sweeping away monarchs, he's sweeping away religious leaders, he's sweeping away um, wealthy business owners. And this is shown to be Lenin getting rid of the things that many Russians considered to be detriments on their society. Um, as I talked about in the previous video and as you learned about in a lot of your lessons, um, the Industrial Revolution and the Tsarist regime um, really were devastating towards uh, the average everyday Russian, and they very much viewed these things as negatives. So with Lenin coming along and getting rid of these institutions, um, many Russians um, were, were grateful for that. Um, and even during the Red Terror, when um, you know your average everyday Russians started to disappear, uh, many of the Russians thought, well, okay, well, these are individuals who are still loyal to these old systems and no change is going to take place until those individuals uh, are gotten rid of as well. So you do have this subset of the Russian population that, that very strongly viewed this as a uh, positive. Now, if we look at some of Lenin's domestic reforms um, from 1917 until you know, roughly 1924, uh, again, there's a lot of things that you would look at and say, wow, that's a really big positive. So for example, let's examine his, um, his very simple slogan, um, peace, bread, and land, um, uh, to see if he delivered on that. So peace, kind of a mixed bag. Um, did Lenin remove Russia from the First World War? Absolutely. Yeah, in the Treaty of uh, brest litovsk uh, he pulled Russia out of the war um, and brought many of those troops home. On the flip side, though, him coming to power starts the Russian Civil War. So was true peace achieved? 
not immediately, um, but in the longer term, um, yes, it was temporarily. Um, land. Uh, did uh, Lenin wind up granting land to the people? Well, one thing that he did is he confiscated the land of the Russian nobles and confiscated the land of the Russian church. Uh, and this land was redistributed to the peasants. So in that regard, yeah, he did fulfill that promise of land. Again, temporarily, because things are going to change in a couple of years. Um, and um, he also tried to make Russian society better for the common everyday Russian laborer. So for example, he established an eight hour workday by law. Um, so this was in contrast to some other states in the industrial revolution that did not place an eight hour workday limit. Uh, Lenin did implement that. Uh, he established a strict separation of church and state. Um, and this would be um, the first time in Russia that this was implemented um, because previously the uh, Russian Orthodox Church and the state were very closely tied together. Um, he also significantly increased women's rights in Russia. Uh, women were now allowed to uh, own and inherit land, which was not a right that they previously had. Women were now allowed to initiate divorce, which again was not a right that women had at the time. Uh, Lenin also um, implemented uh, educational systems uh, in Russia. He established a system of free public education for Russia citizens. Granted, it was a communist style education um, full of pro-communist, anti-capitalist propaganda. But for many Russians, this was their first chance to become educated. He um, created literacy crash courses in Russia in which he enrolled over 5 million people in to try to boost the literacy rates uh, in Russia. And um, another thing he did for the children of Russia is he established a system of state-run or orphanages. Um, and again, these were for orphans of the First World War. Um, now, some of the more mixed things that he did, he nationalized all of the banks public utilities, railways, engineering facilities, textile manufacture, metallurgy, and mining industries. Uh, what they were considered, they were considered essential industries. And Lenin's government took that all over. Um, and so significantly reduced uh, privatization within Russia, which of course would be in line with Marxist thought. Um, he also closed all of the newspapers that were critical of his regime. Um, and something that we in the United States would consider a fundamental right of ours, freedom of the press and freedom of speech, he significantly cracked down upon. So again, we have um, some things that are very strongly positive. What he does domestically outweighed again by some things that are very strongly negative that he does. So in that sense, um, Lenin, like I said, is a very controversial figure um, in Russia. And if you're trying to look at what he does and assess to yourself, okay, well, was he um, a, a positive force for change in Russia or was he a negative force? You always have to weigh those domestic reforms that he makes against things like the red terror, against the things like the reduction in rights for the everyday people. Um, and you also have to ask yourself too, was Lenin's form of autocracy really that much different from the czar's? Ideologically, yes, but in terms of its implementation, um, that's something you may want to examine a bit more closely. You also may want to examine whether or not Lenin truly upheld the ideals of Marxist communism. And I want to take a look at his new economic policy so you can understand that. So his new economic policy was implemented in the final years of his life. Um, for the majority of Lenin's time in power, Russia operated, uh, operated under what was known as the war communism system. And the war communism was to try to get Russia through the Russian Civil War. The way war communism worked 
is that the government would take a look at what they considered to be essential for survival in terms of food production. And they would confiscate everything beyond that. So all surplus production was taken by the government. So if we're looking at grain production here, and you can look to the left of this diagram, you have a hardworking Russian peasant, okay? The government has said, that what he needs in order to survive is a ton of grain per year. So if he grows 10 tons of grain in a year, the government is going to take all of the surplus, which is nine tons of grain, and they're going to leave this peasant with one ton, right? Just what's needed for survival. Now, if we look at the lazy peasant who only grows one ton of grain, well, the government's not going to take any because there is no surplus, right? So what did war communism do for Russia? It actually drove production down quite a bit. What motivation do you have to grow surplus? None, because the government's going to take all of it. So what this led to was pretty significant food shortages throughout Russia. So after the Russian Civil War, Lenin attempts to change this up. And the way he changes it is by <laughs> introducing capitalism into the mix. Um, so under Lenin's new economic policy, rather than taking all surplus, the government is going to take 50% of what you produce. So if again, we look at our hardworking peasant who grows 10 tons of grain, well, the government's gonna take half of that which is five tons. And the peasant is then left with a surplus of four tons. So what can that peasant do with the surplus? Sell it on the market, make a profit off of it. And now the peasant is left with one ton of grain plus the cash from um, the surplus that they've sold. Meanwhile, our lazy peasant, well, government's still gonna take half of what he produces. So he grows one ton of grain, government takes 50%, he's left with only half a ton. And if we're going by what the government said was essential to survive on, he can no longer survive based on that. So now you have a motivation for the lazier peasant to grow more, to produce more, so that they are not left with a lack of food. You also have motivation for a hardworking individual to grow more so that they can make money off of this. This does increase production in Russia. Um, however, it's important to note that um, the Russian currency was bordering on worthless at the time, and so it didn't increase production drastically. Also, there was a split within the Politburo, the ruling committee of the Communist Party in Russia, about whether or not this was a betrayal of Marx's vision. Because in Marxist communism, businesses are not supposed to operate for profit. Very clearly, though, the new economic policy is allowing businesses to operate for profit. It's reintroducing a profit motive. And so this was controversial. And not all of Lenin's inner circle agreed with this uh, new economic policy. So... The new economic policy is going to remain in play until Lenin's successor um, firmly establishes his control over the country. And then he's going to replace it with his own plan, five-year plan, in fact. So again, Lenin's a very controversial figure. And I'll leave it up to you all if you want to think about him as a force for change or a destructive force in terms of Russian politics. Um, what is kind of important to keep in mind is that when Lenin dies in 1924, um, the person who's going to wind up consolidating power after his death, and this shouldn't be a surprise or a spoiler to anyone, is Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin is going to largely be able to consolidate his power by holding up Lenin as an icon, um, as a, an object of worship, 
almost. And Stalin is going to portray himself as the person who is best suited to carry out Lenin's vision, to carry out Lenin's plan. And that anyone who opposes Stalin opposes the vision of Lenin. We can assume that because Stalin is successful in this strategy, that Lenin's image and Lenin's legacy, at least amongst the ruling body in Russia at the time, was very strongly a positive one. And they looked at Lenin's vision and they looked at uh, Lenin's changes as uh, having almost a religious significance. And this is highly ironic, of course, because you know Lenin was no friend of religion. But because Lenin is held up as this object of worship, almost infallible, Stalin is able to capitalize on that. And he's able to browbeat a lot of his colleagues uh, into following him because of him holding up Lenin as this almost sacred and holy um, set of ideals. So hopefully that gave you some more insight into Vladimir Lenin. It gave you some more insight into the years between 1918 and 1924 uh, in Russia. And hopefully it helps you to better analyze Lenin's place in history. I hope you all have a good day and I will talk to you again soon.